if you get a job bump just from eating fish, then you might want to reconsider your performance enhancing drug protocol. Oh man, I can't imagine it, dude. Vigor Steve here. Let's address those skin splitting shin splints, the duo erection lower back pumps, and while we're at it, the chicken, brown rice, and broccoli lockjaw. All of these side effects you probably didn't expect, didn't anticipate when you started dabbling with the performance enhancing drugs, but still manifested. And now you're getting excruciating pumps in all these body parts where you did not expect. I mean, you started taking steroids to get awesome pump in your arms on arm day, but not get these shin splints, lower back pumps, or pumps in your jaw to the point you can't even eat another bite, or walk another step, or need to sit down in between sets, because, well, you can't walk away from it. I'm sure many of you guys have experienced these terrible pumps. So in this video, we're going to address all of that, give you guys some suggestions and solutions, so you don't ever have to experience those pumps ever again before we get into it please like the video leave a comment for the algorithm and consider subscribing if you haven't already so you can join the vigorous crew and you will be rewarded with a frontable bicep at the end of every video all right let's start with a couple examples on when these excruciating pumps might occur shin splints might happen from walking alone now it doesn't happen during a cutting phase unless you're really on a boatload of drugs Shin splints usually occur either post cutting phase when you're right, inducing some edema because you're eating like an asshole and, and you're gaining so much body weight that you're water retentive um, even on your ears and nose. And then of course uh, in the shins as well. So you start walking a little bit, you get a pump, water retention to the point it's excruciating and it might happen just from walking. Now that's walking during the off season usually for 10 minutes to 15 minutes in duration when you're heavier body weight, water retentive, full with glycogen, or using a decent amount of uh, pharmacology that promotes nitrogen, glycogen, uh, electrolyte retention, even in the smaller muscles, you might even experience some cramping in your hands, which is this muscle right here in your fist. You know, you do heavy barbell rows with an overhand grip. Even this will start to cramp in a similar fashion that you get these excruciating uh, shin splints. So it doesn't happen during a cutting phase, but during the off season when you're walking and you're literally loaded with everything, food and drugs, then yeah, shin splints might manifest in as little as 15 minutes of walking of doing cardio. This is why I always advise people to do some cardio upon waking. So you kind of train your body to take care of some of the glycogen and the metabolic waste products, which are produced in these small muscles of the shins so you don't get into these excruciating pumps later in the day so if you can sustain 30 minutes of fasted cardio during the off season it's very very unlikely that you'll develop shin splints while walking outside while doing calf raises um, while doing cardio later in the day or any other form of activity that might induce shin splints and then of course the pumps you might get in your jaw you know, could be from dry food. Again, you know, uh, cooked chicken, boiled chicken, brown rice, incredibly dry, broccoli, oh, horrible. So if you're eating a lot of dry foods because you've been doing your nutritional research in the Stone Age, uh, yeah, it's easily resolved to, right, by, by just cooking a little bit better or blending everything into shakes, which is not unheard of. Like a lot of guys there are on a boatload of pharmacology and they get this uh, right, this jaw pump every time they eat a meal, even if it's um, you know fish. And right? it really that means you're on a fuckload of shit. <laughs> really, if you get a jaw pump just from eating fish, then you might want to reconsider your performance enhancing drug protocol. Oh man, I can't imagine it, dude. <laughs> you're eating fish and your jaw's like this pumped. You know, I've seen it on. Sometimes you see this on some of the IFB pros, like they, you're eating, right? You have like a, a full day of eating and then you see it and the jaw is just, just like contracting and pulsating and just growing literally in front of your eyes. And you're wondering like, dude, how many anadrols are you on? You know, I can literally see your jawline hypertrophy in front of me. Okay, we're getting off topic, but you guys know what I mean. If you get... The jaw pumps from eating, all you have to do is learn how to cook and otherwise you're going to have to blend 
your food, not go with the whey protein shakes and oatmeal. That That's horrible for your nutrition. You still need some whole protein sources with micronutrients and some healthy fats. So, you know, if you have to make a, a chicken shake with a cream of rice, yeah, sounds nasty, but sometimes that gets the job done. And here in Thailand and other parts of Asia, I've talked with several full-time bodybuilders that actively compete that seem to respond very poorly to oral steroids regarding the jaw pump. So they put Botox in it. And it works very, very well. But in most cases, the anti-aging clinics do Botox in the forehead, which I haven't had. Otherwise, I will lose my eyebrow game, which I don't want to. But some of these clinics are a little bit more progressive. And if you ask around and negotiate a little bit with the administrator, you might be able to get a small amount of Botox administered in your jaw, which from what I've seen with the guys that I talked to over here in Asia, very pronounced very pronounced results that will shrink their jawline to a certain extent and never experience this severe jaw pump that they have uh, during contest prep when they're running a couple oral steroids at the end right, to look phenomenal on stage. So that might be one solution that is a little bit unconventional, um, but very, very suitable from what I've seen. Now the lower back, that's where most of us experience the worst pumps known to man basically and like i mentioned before it's like an erection but in the back of your body and instead of having one erection it's two excruciating not a pleasurable erection an excruciating <laughs> erection in your lower back now it can happen from squats it can happen from deadlifts stiff legged deadlifts rows doing the dishes or you're hunched over the kitchen sink all the time just doing the dishes and drying that off so if you have terrible lower back pumps, I can highly recommend you guys to spend some money and um, right, invest in a dishwasher so you don't have to go through this process once or twice per day where you're hunched over the sink and then you frantically do the dishes within five minutes so you don't get a lower back pump <laughs> just to get this so bad like twice a day. Uh, and then, of course, during the workout. But luckily, I was able to resolve my lower back pumps many, many years ago. Laundry, walking even, shopping, right? Shopping with bags. When you go grocery shopping and you have to carry like five kilos of food in each hand uh, to the car or um, you know, maybe you're even walking home, you consider it cardio. It's like a farmer's walk. And even a farmer's walk can give you excruciating lower back pumps, even sex, depending on the position. It's like lower back pumps get aggravated like this. The smallest incentive the lower back pump will manifest and now you're literally trying to lean back kind of against the lower back erection hoping that it will go over soon but it doesn't in most cases it just stays there for like 20 minutes 30 minutes until it finally starts to dissipate and that's very annoying after sex or after deadlifts or whatever else you're doing at the gym right it, it they can last quite long unless you're incorporating some of the things which we'll discuss in this video. What causes these lower back pumps? In many cases, it's multifactorial. Some people even experience lower back pumps from creatine, so you can be completely drug-free, take creatine and experience lower back pumps. Usually happens during the loading phase of creatine, right? The fitness industry has uh, certainly found its way to make you spend a boatload of money. So instead of being patient and using five grams of creatine for a week, or 10, right? You The first four weeks, you go and uh, double the dose or 20 grams of creatine so you can go through those tubs very, very fast and do the loading phase to saturate all of your skeletal muscle with creatine and have phenomenal workouts. Well, it might also cause some side effects, one of which being the lower back pump. So what I would recommend, whether you're drug-free or enhanced, take it easy, be patient, and start your creatine at five grams Maybe you build your way up to 10 grams if back pumps don't manifest, right? I take personally, I take five grams of creatine in my pre-workouts, no lower back pumps. And sometimes I take 10 grams of creatine on a leg day, for example, or chest day if I feel a little bit naughty, scoop a little bit more. Right? Gorilla mode nitric, 10 grams of creatine and a whole lot of other good stuff. No lower back pumps, only chest pumps or leg pumps. For most of us, the shin splints, the lower back pumps, the pump jaw happens due to oral steroids. And most of the oral steroids can potentiate these excruciating pumps. All right, there's methods to mitigate it, but Anivar, Deanabol, Turinabol, Superdrol, Anadrol, 
Winstrol to a certain extent, albeit that usually Winstrol is used in a cutting phase and people are generally a little bit leaner, less caloric intake. So it doesn't happen as much as with Anavar, Dianabol, Superdrol, Anadrol, or Turinabol. And with Halotestin, maybe it's due to the short exposure duration. It's also very, very rare that um, lower back pumps manifest with Halotestin the last two weeks leading into a contest. Now, I've talked with several powerlifters, strongmen, that take Halotestin leading into a strongman competition. And some of them even say that they can't take it for longer than three days because that's when the lower back pump starts to manifest and that hinders their performance on the day of the competition or the meet. So they use it intermittently. They might load up on Superdraw for a while and then switch to Halotestin or just use it for a short window of time where lower back pumps are either manageable or don't manifest again so they don't lose performance on the day that it matters. And then, well, you guys are going to ask about Proviron. Um, yeah, that's probably the only oral steroids without any real anabolic benefits that doesn't potentiate lower back pump. So in that sense, you're good if you want to crush your sexual binding globulin. I don't think you have to worry about getting uh, lower back pumps or shin splints when you sprinkle in a little bit of Proviron. Most of the other oral steroids, um, yeah, they have a potential for lower back pumps. So when you do take oral steroids, Instead of throwing the kitchen sink at it, I know it sounds like a broken record, but let's just start slow. Let's start at a low dose and build our way up so we don't get these side effects to the point you need to sit down um, or abort your workout because your lower back pumps are so severe, right? You do one set of squats, you take that set to failure, maybe not even to failure because your lower back is so horribly tight and the butt wink, you know, even, even a millimeter of butt wink makes it horrible and well with the deadlift i mean right, there's no way around it basically that uh, that's all. the deadlift is designed for lower back stimulation in that case it's better just to build up your oral slowly start with a low effective dose and as you gain more muscle mass and your body starts to adapt to excrete the metabolic waste products from skeletal muscle including your lower back or your shins while doing fasted cardio and using some of the supplements, which I'll discuss a little bit later, you should be able to slowly adapt right, to this increasing amount of muscle mass that's being accumulated in your lower back or your shins or in the jaw for that matter. And an ability to excrete these metabolic waste products. And there might be something to say for citrulline malate or beta alanine, um, even though it will make you feel horrible, but all itch, right? And there might be something to say to help with the excretion of metabolic waste products and prevent or reduce these back pumps or shin splints from getting too severe. But if you're already on a hefty dose of oral steroids and those lower back pumps are intense AF, you might want to lower the dose for a while until you mitigate the lower back pumps and learn how to power your way through with exercises and supplementation before you continue with the previous dose that you were running. So let's say you were on 50 milligrams of Anivar, for example. Um, for me, it's an intolerable dose, but some people like to run that much. Maybe reduce it to 25 milligrams. Get those lower back pumps and shin splits under control before you continue with that dose. Again, it's the same for the Anibal, Terinibal. You have to dose, resolve the issues, and then potentially go back on the same dose so you can accumulate more strength and muscle tissue. Now, with the injectables, it happens also. Trembolone, Ment, Trestolone, Nandrolone, all known to potentiate lower back pumps and shin splints. With the injectables, you also have to keep in mind the caloric intake, right? So if you're right in the off-season, your calories are high, you have a little bit of Tren or Trestolone or Nandrolone in the picture to potentiate more anabolism, which cascades into mineral retention, glycogen retention, um, water retention potentially, in those cases, yeah, you might get some shin splints or lower back pumps, and, and then it's going to be a trade-off. Can you tolerate those excruciating pumps while you're accumulating more muscle mass? Or do you need to lower the dose of train, Trestolone or Nandrolone to the point where you don't have these excruciating pumps anymore or they're mitigated to an extent that you can tolerate them again, or at least better? Or do you need to take them out and... Consider something like boldenone, primobolin, a higher dose of testosterone. Instead, the supplements that you can incorporate during this time, which everybody should incorporate, taurine. Taurine, taurine, taurine. I've mentioned this many times before. 
Taurine is very potent in mitigating some of the carpal tunnel syndromes induced by growth hormone, or MK677 for that matter, elevated serum growth hormone concentrations for prolonged periods of time or points of the day. Taurine is very potent to mitigate carpal tunnel syndrome or lower back pumps and shin splints because taurine helps to regulate the osmotic pressure, which is the water balance between the intracellular and extracellular space. And if you get a mega pump in the lower back and all this fluid and glycogen and nitrogen, etc., is locked into place within the cell itself, taurine is able to help with a little bit of this water balance and disperse and siphon and remove some of this water and perhaps metabolic waste products and other content of the cell into the extracellular space, which allows it to be transported into lymphatic system, assuming that you do some activity, or into the bloodstream. So you're already siphoning off all this pump, water, everything else from the lower back muscles, the shin muscles, and the jaw muscles into the extracellular space and mitigating and reducing this excruciating pump. Now, it's not a foolproof method. Again, if you're running a very high dose of orals or you're very poorly managing your electrolyte intake or your, um, right, your diet in general, then taurine will help, but it will not completely resolve it. But if you focus on your electrolyte intake, which I already made a video about a long, 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 long time ago, you can watch it here. If you manage your electrolyte and water intake and stay on top of your taurine intake, you can mitigate so much of these issues already, really guys. And for me, I haven't had a lower back pump, shin splint or locked jaw in years, in years, because I've been supplementing with 5,000 milligrams taurine before each workout. And I even spaced it out over the day on my rest days, because even though you're mitigating some of the pump during the workout, again, you're minimizing the pump in the lower back and the shins by taking taurine, and you might also minimize or diminish the pump in the skeletal muscle that you're training. So that's something you have to keep in mind. The taurine will take the edge off your pump when you're training particular body parts, even if you take vasodilators and pump products like sodium nitrate, glycerol, creatine, it might diminish some of the pump. Otherwise, taurine would be a part of every pre-workout formula or pump product, which it's not. Right? So you're diminishing some of your uh, gorilla mode nitric pump by taking taurine, but you're also preventing uh, a lot of the possibility to get a lower back pump or shin splint, causing you to abort your workout or have a less productive workout. So I prefer to take taurine and maybe take 5% of the pump away instead of sitting there uh, cursing at the sky or hunched over or leaning back or whatever position is the most comfortable when these uh, lower back pumps manifest. And of course, I've been on top of my electrolyte intake, carefully managing my sodium, my potassium, my calcium, my magnesium, and in certain cases, also my phosphorus. I carefully manage that, so I don't get any of these issues of carpal tunnel syndrome, shin splints, lower back pumps, etc. There are a couple methods to mitigate the lower back pumps faster, and it mostly has to do with vasoconstrictors. So if you are having an excruciating lower back pump, for example, or shin splint, you can take a vasoconstrictor in the form of coffee, which will also help to siphon off some of the water that's accumulating in that area. So coffee or something like ephedrine, for example, if that's legal in your country, or DMAA, right? that old hardcore um, pre-workout that is um, rarely available nowadays. Right, some of the vasoconstrictors, they will actually help to siphon off some of the uh, fluid that's accumulating in that area by preventing new fluid to enter that area. So you're constricting the blood vessels, less water and blood flow to that area. And the taurine will actually allow more water to exit the area than is being restored. So that's one method. Coffee will do the trick. And again, guys, you don't want to use vasoconstrictors chronically besides coffee, which is reasonably innocuous. So you can drink coffee once or twice per day, get a small amount of vasoconstriction, but none of the negative health ramifications later on. But if you use other methods to control vasoconstriction, raising blood pressure chronically, which will inevitably detract from your kidney health, 
It will also compromise your workouts to an extent that you might get nosebleeds. So even though you might mitigate the lower back pumps and shin splints allowing you to continue your workouts, if you do go hard and heavy on squats, leg press or deadlifts and your blood pressure goes up very, very high, well, now you get a nosebleed and you explode blood all over the gym. Um, happened to me a couple times. And also, that you know, you'll have to clean up, which might take even longer than sitting down <laughs> trying to um, wait for this terrible lower back pump to calm down. So right, not for chronic use, a strong coffee will do after you finish your workout and you're sitting there with an excruciating uh, lower back pump. And if you take DMAA pre-workout, that might be able to mitigate it. But I would really focus on your breathing technique so you don't hold your breath, which raises blood pressure even further, really raising the potential for you to burst a couple blood vessels in your nose or even your eyes. Now, a couple exercises which will help to mitigate the lower back pumps, but initially they will make it worse. Right? The reverse hyperextension. So let's say you're experiencing these uh, lower back pumps and you start doing hyperextensions while you experience these lower back pumps, this will be even worse. You will feel horrible. It will be more excruciating. But you're creating an adaption process where not only the fascia will stretch in the lower back allowing for a little bit more volume to um, occur later on, right? When your body adapts to this fascia stretching, for, uh, so to say. You also instruct your lower back to take care of these metabolic waste products by excreting the fluid and the right and all that stuff over time. So when you do have a lower back pump, this is what I did years ago. I didn't have the knowledge or the taurine or the electrolyte supplementation when I was having severe lower back pumps or shin splints. So after a while, I got so frustrated, I lost a little bit of respect for my lower back because it would happen like almost every workout when I was running oral steroids. And then I would reluctantly wobble over to the hyperextension bench, grab a resistance bands, maybe this thick, you know, not too strenuous, but enough for some progressive resistance on the way through the movement, wrap it around the bottom of the bench and around my neck, hold it in place, and then go to town. To the point I could feel my lower back contract and pump up from my butt crack to the back of my neck. Very, very painful, right? I would just keep going. Right? I was like, dude, F you. I'm going to keep going until you explode. And honestly, it helped. It helped over time. The first couple of weeks that I did it, of course, during that moment, it made it worse, right? You had a, a moderate lower back pump. You start doing that hyperextensions with a resistance band, just keep going, keep going, maybe 20, 30, 50 reps even. That's what I worked my way up. And just keep going until you like, literally fail and, and yeah, well, the muscle is so pumped you can't really go anywhere. So that helped over time to really stretch the fascia a little bit and adapt my body to take care of these metabolic waste products which happen um, while you're getting lower backs from deadlifts or squats or whatever else which certainly gets worse while you're doing these uh, hyperextensions. So that takes some time, some something to get used to, um, a painful procedure that you have to go through. But really, over time, it makes it a lot better to the point it, it, it doesn't really uh, come anymore. Of course, nowadays, I'm using taurine and electrolytes and, and manage my water balance that way and stay away from hard, uh, heavy dosages of orals. But during the period that I was... Uh, on orals and not taking any taurine or managing my electrolytes properly, those hamper extensions with the resistance bands really made a difference. And nowadays, I do the reverse hyper extensions every week, which I feel is also very beneficial. It, it will not pump your lower back up that much because there's a lot more um, hip and glute recruitment on the reverse hyper extension. Now, of course, a lot of people don't have the reverse hyper extension machine at their gym or can't really load it up that heavy. Luckily at the muscle factory we have one, so I could load it up with a couple plates per side and really use a little bit of momentum to decompress my back and the scar tissue in my upper glutes, which I was able to resolve with the reverse hyperextension machine. Just keep doing hypers, keep doing hypers until all that scar tissue is literally separated and torn apart from the, um, right, the negative portion, which pulls you a little bit into a precarious position. But really the reverse hyperextension machine, when it comes to scar tissue and right, hip mobility and uh, mitigating some of the lower back pump, feel is highly beneficial if you have it available 
at your gym. The inversion table is also helpful. Of course, that will be a purchase that you have to make yourself where you invert your body for maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes per day to help decompress the spine. It will not be as effective to uh, mitigate lower back pumps or shin splints for that matter uh, compared to the, the hyperextension methods, but it might still offer some benefits if you have a little bit tight lower back and some issues in that area. And then the cheapest option is just foam rolling, man. You remember those, right? They used to be all the hype. Everybody on YouTube used to have their own foam roll, right? All the fitness YouTubers of the golden days used to have their own foam roller uh, because gray area supplementation affiliate programs were not available. So a lot of guys uh, moved towards that. But foam rollers used to be all the hype. They do work, albeit it's a little bit cumbersome. Uh, some of those foam rollers literally looked like blown up dildos <laughs> with like all kinds of different shapes and like uh, dildos for the depraved. It doesn't need to have all these fancy knobs and uh, bells and whistles, it can just be a smooth one. You just do 10 minutes, 50 minutes of foam rolling on the lower back to help alleviate some of the bound up tissue, the scar tissue, remove some of the metabolic waste products and really stretch out that area and allow for some proper blood flow while you're working out. And most guys don't experience any lower back pumps if they just do a little bit of foam, foam rolling ahead of time. And they can continue with their orals, assuming that the taurine is in place pre-workout, 5,000 milligrams, and the electrolytes are managed as well as the water intake. And in those cases, foam rolling 10 minutes, 15 minutes before the workout on your lower back with a couple uh, positions to really disperse and loosen up the area, is often more than enough to mitigate the lower back pumps completely. And you can also foam roll on your shins, right? To mitigate the shin splints potentially post-workout when you start doing your walking cardio. So foam rolling is highly beneficial. I'm sorry I saved it all for the end, but I just wanted to address a couple other points in this video that you probably didn't think about that could help mitigate some of these excruciating pumps. And this way you don't really have to lower the oral steroid dosage or the injectable dosage. You do still need to pay attention to your electrolyte intake and manage your diet accordingly because that's where some of the pumps are coming from also. And well, you can't foam your roll your way out of a horrible diet. I think that pretty much covers it. I really hope you're able to resolve these issues as I did many, many years ago. I haven't had a lower back pump in a while. Um, I, I might have had a lower back pump here and there after I went back to the gym, you know, after a food orgy at the hotel buffet for a couple of days where you get very water retentive and you hold a lot of water and then you go straight into the leg press because you want to do a leg day and uh, because you ate way too much food and you would want to put that to work and get all this water retention off. Yeah, and then you work your way up to 10 plates. Man, I have to abort because the lower back is so pumped that you can't possibly do hack squats or even regular squats or even leg extensions after that. So I learned my lesson. Most of the time I don't have any lower back pumps because I don't overdo the steroids anymore and uh, the taurine and electrolytes are in place. And of course, I'm on top of my reverse hypers because reverse hypers are life. I'll leave it at that, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vigorsteve.com slash shop. Personalized advice always available through consultations. You can find the rates in the consultation section. Follow me on Instagram at VigorSteve. No pump, front double bicep for you guys. Not excruciating in any way, shape or form. But if I extend my arms, you will hear a clicking noise. Oh. Old, but not obsolete. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.